Hi, everybody. It's Jay, and I am back in the booth with you for another sneak peek video preview for this week's new release here on Say With Jay. Our new release this week is episode three of Jesse Gusman's Second Chance With You. It's the fourth book in her Baxter Boys Sweet Romance series, and I'll have a little bit more about the episode and a preview for you in just a bit. But I wanted to take the opportunity to share something in a devotion that I read this past week, and it seems pretty timely because we're coming up on my favorite season of the year. Now, I don't mean late summer because it is still hot as Hades here in Georgia and way too humid. And I don't mean the coming fall because, well, I'm not really that much of a pumpkin spice sort of guy. But I am, of course, talking about college football season, which kicks off this coming Saturday. Although many of our favorite teams won't play for two Saturdays. Roll Tide. And aside from being a chance to shamelessly plug the University of Alabama, my alma mater, again, Roll Tide, it's a chance to share this devotion writer's thoughts about how team sports are a lot like Christianity. And if you've ever played team sports much at all, it's spot on. Because as a team, you're heading toward a common goal with your teammates. And sometimes you play with teammates that you don't really like and get along with all the time. So when that's the case, things like humility and grace and forgiveness are necessary. But more to the point, not everyone on your team will have their best game every single game. And that's the time when, as teammates, you support and lift up the teammates who aren't having that great a game. So I just wanted to simply encourage you that if you're having a day where it's just not your best game, look around. Let your teammates, your friends, your family, other sources of of support like devotions and prayer and things like that, let them be the ones to lift you up and encourage you and carry you if need be. And hey, if you are having a great game today, look around and see if you can't be that encouragement to somebody to lift them up and carry them if needed. Okay, thanks for letting me share that. So let's talk a little bit about episode three of Second Chance with You. Now, uh, as I've mentioned before, because we're going to be talking about the third episode in this book, if you've not seen or listened to episodes one and two, there might be some light spoilers here. I try to keep that to an absolute minimum that you won't really learn anything that you couldn't read on the book product description on Amazon. But if you are somebody who just can't abide spoilers in any form, just be warned that we're going to obviously have to be discussing things that have occurred in the previous two episodes. Okay. As we have said previously, Second Chance With You is the story of Riley Coleman. She's the daughter of a trucking magnate, uh, an owner of Coleman Trucking, who has ordered Riley to leave her, the terminal she manages in Maine, and go to their home terminal down in Brickley Springs, Pennsylvania, which happens to be the worst performing terminal in the company. And her father has ordered her to go down and turn it around. Riley figures out pretty quickly that if she's going to have any chance of success at all, she has to convince her shop manager and lead mechanic to go with her because that's where a lot of the problems lie there in Brickley Springs. Her shop manager, lead mechanic, is Ben Baxter. 
He happens to be the oldest of the Baxter brothers. And Ben, unbeknownst to Riley, is from Brickley Springs. Now, there are a couple of problems with getting Ben to go back. Ben ran away from Brickley Springs when he was just a young teenager after finding out that his father, who was not a nice guy, actually had a separate family, Ben's birth mother, in Maine. So Ben left home in Brickley Springs to find his mom and his two sisters. And he's not been back since. He has kept in contact with his grandmother and, for reasons I won't spoil, has told her that he is married. Well, when his grandmother suffers a medical emergency, he realizes he has no choice but to return home. But he doesn't want to appear, and the first thing they know about him is that he's lied this whole time about his life in Maine. The second complication is that he and Riley have a rather painful romantic history. Again, which I won't spoil. But he agrees to go to Brickley Springs and help Riley turn around the terminal there on one condition, that she marry him so that when he does meet his family, the lie that he's married has become truth. Now, in episode three, it starts out that they've just arrived in Brickley Springs to go visit his grandmother in the hospital. And that's where our little preview picks up, and I hope you enjoy it, and then come back for the full episode this Friday here on Say With Jay. Ben listened to the woman beside him snore. She'd been out for the past several hours, and now that they were less than 30 minutes from the hospital where his gram was, he figured he should wake her. But how? If it were one of the twins, he'd just grab her arm and shake her. He hadn't coddled them growing up. Maybe they could have used the softness of a mother's touch at times, but they had each other to comfort themselves, so he wasn't worried about it. But Riley? It seemed a little calloused to just grab her and shake. Not to mention, he'd touched her at the courthouse, just her hand, but it had almost been a disastrous mistake. Whatever the attraction was that constantly simmered inside of him when she was around had exploded into bright lights and shooting sparks when he gripped her hand. Maybe it was the nervousness combined with the atmosphere. They were getting married, after all. But he'd have dropped her hand like a hot iron if he could have. As it was, he'd held as lightly as he could with two fingers, hoping she didn't notice. He glanced over again. Her snoring was kind of cute. He'd never had any thought that she'd snore. Guess the amount of money your family had didn't affect what you did while you were sleeping. What had he done? Actually, what had she done? She should have had him sign a prenup, one that was about 3,000 pages long to keep him from getting any of her family's precious money or assets. He must have really surprised her to keep her from even suggesting it. He would have signed. He wasn't after her stuff. Maybe she trusted him. He already knew she believed in him. Did she trust him that much, too? It wasn't like she didn't know him, or at least know his reputation. The sun had set long ago, and as he slowed to make a turn, the street lights hit her face, soft and vulnerable in slumber light lashes resting on soft cheeks, her slender hands tucked under her chin. He always thought of her as strong and decisive, determined, but right now she looked fragile and defenseless. It stirred his protective instincts, like the twins did, like when his mother had gotten sick. 
He wanted to reach over and draw her closer, pull her into the protected circle of his arm, have her rest her head on his shoulder and lean on him. After all, she believed in him, and she trusted him too. The least he could do was protect her. He married her. Real or fake, he considered it his job to take care of this woman. There would be time later to consider the implications of that. Riley probably didn't want his protection or care, although that's really all he had to offer in exchange for her belief in him and her trust. Didn't really seem like a fair exchange when he'd take all she was giving, but she didn't want all he had to offer. He shook those thoughts away. Thankfully, she stirred when he pulled into the hospital parking lot. It was nearly empty, and he found a spot while she straightened and looked around. We're here? Yeah. He pulled out his phone, more to give her some time to wake up than because he thought he missed anything. There was a text from Cassidy's number telling him Graham had asked about him, and another saying they were leaving the hospital for the day because visiting hours were over. Well, he might be able to intimidate the nurses into letting him see his Graham, but he'd put money on Riley being able to sweet-talk them into it. He grinned. It was nice to have that kind of competence on his side. He looked over at her. Visiting hours were over 45 minutes ago. Think you can get us in to see Graham? The sleepy look had faded from her eyes, but a piece of her hair was bent over the wrong way. He reached up to move it. Her mouth had opened, maybe to answer him, but she froze as his hand touched her hair. He smoothed it down, marveling. With the twins, he'd kept their hair short until they could do it themselves, even though he loved long hair. It was too much trouble to mess with, with everything else he had to do. But with his fingers on Riley's hair, his breath slowed way down as the silk slid along his fingertips, and he actually had to grit his teeth against the desire to plunge his fingers into it, every cell in his hand wanting to feel it slide against his rougher skin. Her eyes widened, maybe at the look on his face, and he dropped his hand immediately. I can probably get us in. Her voice sounded weak, like a motor with no turbo. Do you know where we're going? Yeah, I've got the room number. His heart rate had gone back to almost normal, although his voice held a rough note that wasn't usually there. You ready? She jerked her chin up and reached for the door handle. Hi, this is Jay, and thanks for listening. If you're ready for another great audiobook, here's one we think you might like. Or check out the playlist with all our latest releases. Don't forget to subscribe to Say With Jay, give this video a thumbs up, and tell us what you liked in the comments.